I wanted to talk about anger. Um, I have I have um, a lot of respect for Tara Brock, who will, you've probably heard me talk about her, and she's a, a, a with Insight Meditation Society. Her, her uh, organization is in in Maryland, and she's also a psychologist. Anyway, she's a she's a teacher I really like, and I I recommend her to people. And someone asked me over the weekend at a retreat if uh, if if I had anything they could listen to about parenting, and not with little children, but if I re- could recommend some writings about uh, being a parent to your adult children, and you know we we have this misconception when we're younger that our kids will get to a certain age and they go off on their own and we don't have to think about them as parents anymore. And then we suddenly realize that that's not true, that you're just your parents forever for the rest of your life and theirs. But this person said her kids are doing well. They're all... uh, uh, maybe late twenties and in their thirties, but she just is the ch- the transition to being a good parent to adult children is she's just trying to get a better handle on it and wondered if there were books about that or any Buddhist teachings. And uh, the only talk where I heard someone talk about this was a talk by Tara Brock. So I told her I'd try to find it and send it to her, so I was going through podcasts today. And I never found that talk, but I found uh, some very recent talks she had done on anger. And she said something that was a little startling at first for a Buddhist teacher to say. And she said she feels that uh, spiritual teachings have gotten kind of a wrong slant on anger. And she said even Buddhism, she felt. Because she thought um, anger is a, she called it, necessary, intelligent, and needed emotion. Uh, but she and she said there are reasons why we become we can use that anger to let us know that there's a situation that we really need to deal with, or there's something that. Uh, isn't right, you know, between us and the and the outside. So she calls it necessary because it can often be telling a, like a danger signal for us. And it's intelligent because it's the emotion has some basis that it's arising for. And it's been needed for our uh, evolution. But she said the da- there are a lot of dangers with anger other than you know, offending people or hurting people or yourself. But she said one of the dangers is that anger becomes very addictive. It's like a drug. And so while she she feels that anger is a is it's an emotion that we try in most spiritual teachings, we think it's a bad emotion. And so we're we try to get rid of it or we try to Repress it, I think, is what we often do until we can't repress it anymore. And then, it, of course, it comes up um, in some kind of disguise or it comes up with, and we're out of control with it. And we, we can see, I think, when the Buddha taught about being able to root out those dark emotions like anger, I, I also believe that he's, he, he was telling the truth, that we can replace anger with love. But I think it takes a lot of work. I think we can't just um, come in and meditate a few times and think, okay, now I'm not angry anymore. You know, it's hard work because if we've, uh, if we've had anger as either an addiction, like an emotional addic- addiction, because when we got angry, we could really say what we thought, or that feeling of anger feels powerful. Sometimes it feels like it 
Um, we sometimes call it righteous anger, so it, we feel like it moves us to action. And the purpose of anger originally, when we were animals, would have been to move us to action, to fight, to fight, or get out of you know run away. And um, she suggests that we have to be really aware of what a poison it is because it is so addictive. So she's not saying, well, keep your anger because it's, uh, it, that's, that's an okay emotion. But she's saying we need to recognize that it is an emotion and we can't just uh, wish it away. And she, and she couldn't stress enough in her talks about where she feels like, um, in trying to live a more spiritual life or people who, uh, want to live a more religious life, it's it's like a bad, anger bad, you know, and the other's good, and that we've done a kind of a bad job on ourselves by just repressing it. So the other ways, I was thinking, listening to her, I was amazed that she said that because she probably could take a lot of heat talking about uh, the importance of anger. And not, I, but I think what she was really trying to say: we can't diminish it, we can't wish it away. And there are other other ways that we uh, call anger without using the word anger. So it's uh, being resentful, or being jealous, or or um, being critical or judgmental. And you probably, you know, you can probably think of your personal favorites. But we know a lot of times we don't want to to say I'm just really angry. We know that's that's not that's not nice. But we can say, uh, well, they really upset me. You know that that's a that's a kind of cop out, right? Because nobody can upset us. We upset ourselves. But we can use those phrases that try to put the blame back on the other person. Um, I mean, they're just, if you start thinking about the ways we, it, we, we rephrase our anger so it doesn't come out as kind of uh, what it is. And we can fool ourselves too, so we can be uh, uh, angry but painted as something else. And I was thinking a lot after I listened to her talk about for me, anger still can be a problem, and uh, and I'm really trying to uh, become really aware of how it how it surfaces in my life. And one thing we know is when we work with our mindfulness, we can begin to feel in our bodies what emotions feel like. And so, how what how does anger feel? It's hot. There's heat with it. So you can feel heat in your body, and you feel like a grip around your forehead. You know, you feel things get tight. Your stomach may get queasy. So we can begin to learn that feeling, the physical feeling in our body of our emotional states, and that can that might be that might be enough to keep us from saying something. So rather than deny that we're angry. If we see it clearly for what it is and not, uh, not camouflage it to ourselves, then we can be, we can use our mindfulness practice to just recognize it when it begins to rise up in our bodies. And so I know the, the, the heat and the tension in the head, I can feel that. And, um, Trying to repress that feeling of anger is always, usually for me, it'll come out in wrong speech. And that's also another sign of anger, is when your speech is not the way you want your speech to be. And, and usually once we start talking, it's later that we realize it wasn't, right? In the midst of it, it goes along with all those other bodily symptoms, along with the heat and the pressure and the tension and the tightness. Uh, just that that speech just coming out, angry speech, is is one of the is one of the symptoms of it. So it might be later that we think about it. 
And I think I was thinking about my own life, and I thought, I'm bit, I, and, if, and I also have been paying attention to the politics of the last week or so with the Supreme Court, uh, with the with the Supreme Court hearings, and it, that brings up a lot of stuff. But you know, I was raised in the '50s, and there was it, I was taught to be a good little girl, and in, in the South, which is probably there's even a better slant put on it than here. But it was very important to be a good little girl and to not make any ripples, you know, don't don't be rude, be kind of sickeningly sweet, and uh, don't, you know, always be polite and always respect your elders. And those are good qualities. But as you grow into being a teenager and a young adult, if you're still kind of under those guidelines, it's really hard. I think it's really hard not to be angry. And then when I hit my very early 20s, it was when uh, feminism came up and was a big issue in this country. And there were just a lot of, there was a lot of anger released because of all the women who had been raised, even, even women older than myself who had, had felt it even more. So I can see part of the, my heritage, you know, of where I grew up, how I grew up. Uh, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of repression that goes along with it. But it, no matter what that history is, it doesn't. It doesn't make it be the way I want to be now. And listening to the hearings was enough to just, you know, I could feel myself needing to back away from the. Uh, I, could, I couldn't watch everything on TV, and I was so glad I didn't have a TV. So I'd read, uh, I wouldn't read the New York Times or the Washington Post. I'd read National Public <laughs> News, and I might listen to some clips. <clears throat> but I had to be really careful because a lot of what was being said just, just uh, provoked a lot of strong feelings in me. And I had to, I had to sort that out. And had to, you know, make decide. Wow, we're, I knew where it was coming from. That wasn't a mystery at all. But um, you know, what was what was there for me to do about it? How was I? How do I contain that? How do I? How do I have a a big container for myself to keep me from this like exploding out? Like I I bought a, a Instapot recently because I thought, oh, it's supposed to be so great cooking things, but I'm afraid of the pressure cooker. So I have never used that. I haven't used my Instapot yet, because I'm afraid of that explosion that pressure cookers make. And my mom used one all the time, and it never exploded. But we had warnings all the time, don't slam the door. Mom's cooking you know, something in the pressure cooker. Or uh, don't get too loud in the kitchen with the pressure cookers on. It might, you know, there was always this fear that that pressure cooker was going to explode. So, with all the stuff that's been on the news about those the Supreme Court hearings, I I felt like okay, I need something to hold the pressure to hold the pressure. To, it just uh, it it was there was so much about it that was so kind of deeply um, painful. And over the course of last week, I must have taught women who came to me to talk, not not me, I don't sit around talking about it, but people who came to me and said, I need to talk to somebody about this, but, uh, you know, like people over 80 even, or people younger, when I listen to these hearings, I'm having a really hard time because when I was 13, I was raped, and nobody, no, nobody wanted me to talk about it, and they pretended it never happened. And when I was with somebody else, when I was 15, I was gang raped by three boys, and the and the adults, it wasn't that they didn't even believe this person. This, these both incidences were the same person, but nobody even wanted her to say it out loud, like. She told the adults, and they just 
cleaned her up, you know, and, and never mentioned it again. Now, you can imagine that sort of violence on someone 13 years old and 15 years old. And they were essentially told, okay, we believe you, it happened, but don't ever talk about it. We can't talk about it. And now be 70 or 80 years old and uh, listen to the news and all of that. It's PTSD, you know, it just comes back to you. And I've had three different women who've come to me and said, you know, thank, this, this happened to me when I was really young ages. It was even shocking to me. And uh, how difficult it was because of the way either they weren't believed or they were made to be ashamed. Well, the shame comes, the shame for, for most women comes from themselves. So the people who talked to me who were raped said, I was, at the time I didn't want to talk about it, so I was glad when they told me, we don't, we don't, we're not going to talk about this, because I was so ashamed. Not because I did anything, but just because, you know, they were saying, I was just ashamed, like it was my fault that this happened to me. So that, that has been part of this week for me, um, uh, just hearing people's stories and realizing that's not changing in our country. So I felt like I need a container for this. I don't want to be, I don't want to be angry, but I have to deal with the fact that this is, there are still great inequities in this country and there's still a great, uh, it's, it's things will think, we know this is samsara. We know that it's never going to be, like we aren't going to change the world to make it be different than uh, than what it is, but it feels like there's been so little progress in terms of people being able to talk to one another and listen to each other, or to uh, have sexual equality or any uh, any other qual- equalities, and it, there's always. Uh, uh, money and power and egos and so many things going on at the same time. But for me, it's been a lot about how do I react without it being reacting in anger. And what what was wonderful listening to Tara Brock today was she was saying that, that anger that anger represents something that we need to pay attention to. We don't need to let anger be our uh, go-to reaction, but it's going to be until we learn how to deal with it, until we learn how to work with it. And so I guess what I wanted to say, I think uh, if we think we can just, it's just going to go away because now we're sitting and we're meditating. If we don't really work with it, it's not going to go away. It's just going to go. It's just going. We're going to repress it, or we're going to just try not to be. You know, like walk on uh, walk on pins and needles. That we're not going to get into a situation that's going to make us angry. <laughs> yeah. The issue with anger is what it does to your nervous system. You cannot live. Symptoms of not being able to meditate or sit quietly. Yeah, we. Well, I yeah, it's and it's it's all come. I mean, it's I I agree with you, but the there are other problems about anger that are the problems of us thinking as a group, like thinking as a I don't get angry, or as a woman I don't get angry. Or as a, a, as a person of color, I don't get angry. Like I just, uh, I'm not supposed to, like I'm going to be, I'm going to rise above it or I'm going to just not feel it. I think we have to realize that, that anger can be there. And I'm, I'm really hoping for the day where I feel like I've eradicated mine and pulled it out by the roots. But I realize it's not coming like in the next week or two. It's, it's going to take a lot of work. And, uh, 
And I don't want to feel bad about it until it's eradicated. I, so what do I have to do? I have to have a, a, a plan for, like, step by step, how I'm going to work with it. So I know I can, I know one is to be mindful of when my body feels, if I'm in a situation where I begin to feel those physical symptoms. And then I need to probably just zip my lips and, uh, if I can, get out of the situation. Okay, and then go back and on my own think about it and figure that out. It might be that I'm with toxic people. It might be I'm in a situation that's toxic. It's not, and I can get out of it because that anger's warning me, those symptoms of anger. And I can get out of it without uh, engaging, getting into the, into it for the wrong reasons. You know, use the anger to be my warning signal. So my mindfulness has to be, come into play. And what I'm learning too, there are certain things I can meditate with that are going to help that. And so the, one of the main ones is to meditate on, use loving kindness meditation. That's one of the strongest ones for anger. And we have to really, uh, practice it, you know, more than 15 minutes. We, I mean, it has to become something that we, whenever we have a longer period of time to meditate, that we focus on that. The other subjects that are, that are recommended in the, in the Buddhist teachings are to meditate with the four, the four uh, supreme qualities, the four brahmahati, brahmahatiyas. I didn't say that right. Brahma viharas, brahma viharas, and those are the qualities of compassion and loving kindness and uh, sympathetic joy, joy for others, and equanimity. If we can use those as our meditation subjects. And let those, let that be a subject with our, for our meditation to, to go into a deeper understanding and engagement with those qualities. That that's one of the best antidotes for anger. And again, it takes, it's like, here's the plan. Here's what I want to work on. Being, being more aware of my body, practicing loving kindness, uh, practicing meditating with those four Brahma Viharas, those four supreme qualities, and just gradually building up, you know, getting to that point where I can see in my life that angers, that I don't need that anger to be my warning, uh, warning sign or my, uh, my response. I can, I can begin to have a different relationship with things in my environment. So I just wanted to share that with you because if you, if you've uh, been like me and when, when anger does arise, it feels, it's like, oh, I feel ashamed of this. I should be, I'm not supposed to be angry, right? And look at me. I'm a Buddhist nun. I'm not supposed to be angry. Well, that's just a denial of myself as a person. And my own journey in this life has a lot to do with dealing with anger. I mean, that's, par- that's a part of my journey. So if I try to say, I'm, I can't be angry, then I'm saying I can't take care of what I need to take care of this lifetime. And so I think uh, the way to deal with it is to deal with it and not be, uh, but, but don't become addicted to it. It's never like, oh, it's okay, I'm an angry person, that's just how I am. That's not what it's talking about. It's, I have a tendency towards anger. And so I am doing something about it. And this is, these are some of the things I'm doing. And it's a high priority. So I, I just wanted to share that with you. It's, it might be helpful. Does anybody have a question? You had your hand up. Did you want to say something? Yeah. 
Yeah, I, and thank you. I do too. <clears throat> right, always overcoming it. I thank you. I, I mean, that's exactly what I. That's what exactly what I wanted to share. That it's not something we should should uh, repress or not deal with because we think that's not the kind of person I want to be or. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I meditate, I'm a Buddhist, I'm not angry. And that can, or I'm a Christian, I'm not angry, or I'm, I'm Jewish, so I can't be angry. I mean, we can't, uh, use spirituality to hide us from our anger. And I don't think it, its intention is that. Instead, we can intelligently work with it. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat>